I'm News Force Tracy Wilkins. Welcome to this historic day. We're just moments away from Democrat Wes Moore taking the oath of office, becoming the first black governor in Maryland's history, the third elected black governor in American history. We will be taking that oath of office using the Bible once owned by Frederick Douglass, the abolitionist who fought to end slavery in his home state of Maryland and across the nation. President, Luna Miller, Madam Montgomery Speaker, County uh, delegate, it will be the first lieutenant governor who is of South Asian descent. She was elected as lieutenant governor, becoming the first woman to immigrate from India to Maryland to hold that position. Now, Moore spent the first few years of his life in Tacoma Park, Maryland. He then moved to New York after the death of his dad and later moved to Baltimore. This was Moore's first run for public office after leading a nonprofit that fought poverty. His election sealed control of every level of Maryland government for the Democrats, including including the House, the Senate, the Attorney General's office, and Comptroller. Moore will be replacing two-term Republican Governor Larry Hogan, who's leaving office with a 72% approval rating in one of the most Democratic states in the country. He leaves Moore a $2.5 billion budget surplus. Hogan told me in a recent interview that he's advised Moore to govern from the middle and not from the extremes of his party. That's something Hogan prided himself in doing. Moore is promising radical change throughout the state of Maryland, including ending generational poverty, improving state education, and de-escalating imprisonment. Now, my colleague Jeff Salkin of the Maryland Public Television will be helping to narrate today's inauguration. Are sharing together. We appreciate you, Lord. We thank you for all that you do. In your great name we pray. Amen. Amen. There will soon be a knock at the door of the Maryland Senate, the heavy wooden doors, before the new lieutenant governor and her family are admitted. Lieutenant, lieutenant Governor Miller served in the General Assembly. She was a member of the House of Delegates representing Montgomery County. She was born in India, first immigrant to serve as Lieutenant Governor of Maryland, an engineer by training. She is married. Her husband, David Miller, becomes the state's second gentleman, and they have three daughters. Miller. I, Aruna Katragata Miller. Do swear. Do swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And that I will be faithful. And that I will be faithful. And bear true allegiance to the state of Maryland. And true bear allegiance to the state of Maryland. And support the Constitution. And support the Constitution. And laws thereof. And laws thereof. And that I will. And that I will. To the best of my skill and judgment. To the best of my skill and judgment. Diligently and faithfully. Diligently and faithfully. Without partiality or prejudice. Without partiality or prejudice. Execute the office of. Execute the office of. Lieutenant Governor of Maryland. Lieutenant Governor of Maryland. According to the Constitution and laws of this state. According to the Constitution and the laws of this state. And that I will not. And that I will not. Directly or indirectly. Directly or indirectly. Receive the profits. Receive the profits. Or any part of the profits. Or any part of the profits. Of any other office. Of any other office. During the term. During the term. Of my acting as Lieutenant Governor of Maryland. As my acting as Lieutenant Governor of Maryland. Congratulations, Lieutenant Woo! Governor. Oath of office will be Maryland's new governor, Wes Moore. He becomes Maryland's first black governor. 62 governors have gone before him, all white males. Mr. Moore 
is a veteran, served uh, in the Army in the 82nd Airborne in Afghanistan, a Rhodes Scholar, resident of Baltimore, and won election in a landslide, more than a landslide, a 32-point margin of victory as he talked about expanding economic opportunity and leaving no one behind. The indoor proceedings at the State House will be followed by a public outdoor ceremony in front of the building. That begins at 1230. We will bring that to you live as well. Rumors have it there may be some very interesting uh, celebrity guests with us. We will see this afternoon. The new governor is going to take the oath of office with his hand on two Bibles, one belonging to his grandfather, a minister, the other formerly the property of Frederick Douglass, Maryland native, slave, famous orator, and abolitionist. Now to be introduced, Governor Westmore. Mr. President, it's a distinct honor and privilege to announce in the presence of these chambers the governor-elect, Mr. Wesley. <laughs> Attended. Amari Moore and his family. Mr. Moore is joined on the podium by his wife, Dawn. Mr. Moore is new to the State House. Dawn is not. She was an aide to now Attorney General Anthony Brown when he served as Lieutenant Governor. Okay, so place your left hand on the Bible and raise your right hand. Repeat after me. I, Wesley Watende Omari Moore. I, Wesley Watende Omari Moore, do swear, do swear, that I will support, that I will support, the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the United States, and that I will be faithful, and that I will be faithful, and bear true allegiance to the state of Maryland, and that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to the state of Maryland, and support the Constitution and laws thereof, and support the Constitution and laws thereof, and that I will, and that I will, to the best of my skill and judgment, to the best of my skill and judgment, Diligently and faithfully. Diligently and faithfully. Without partiality or prejudice. Without partiality, partiality or prejudice. Execute the office of. Execute the office of. Governor of Maryland. Governor of Maryland. <laughs> According to the Constitution and laws of this state. <laughs> According to the Constitution and laws of this state. And that I will not. And that I will not. Directly or indirectly. Directly or indirectly. Receive the profits. Receive the profits. Or any part of the profits. Or any part of the profits. Of any other office. Of any other office. During the term of my acting. During the term of my acting. As Governor of Maryland. As Governor of Maryland. Congratulations, Governor. <laughs> The new governor signing the official register in the Senate chamber, surrounded by his family, his children, Mia and James, looking extremely happy. They're going to be moving to a strange new city in Annapolis in a new home, the governor's mansion, but word has it they're getting a puppy as part of the deal. Joy Moore, Wes's mother, hugging the Senate president, Bill Ferguson. We don't expect any words in the chamber 
The formal remarks will be delivered in about 20 minutes outdoors, and we will bring that to you live. If we can take a look at what's happening outside of the Maryland State House, the lawn has been set. Lawyers Mall is, is covered with chairs. The outdoor ceremony uh, will have a master of ceremonies, Stuart Pittman will handle the honors. There is construction, you can see, on the left side of the screen, which limited the, uh, the seating a little bit. Now, earlier this morning, about an hour ago, there was a procession over from Government House, the new governor being escorted by members of the, uh, the State National Guard, the leadership of the National Guard, Mr. Moore uh, himself, not a stranger to being in uniform, having served in the 82nd Airborne, having been in military school as a young man and knowing how to deliver a crisp salute. When he walked through the doors of the State House a short time ago to become its governor, he walked through the doors that are behind me, over my right shoulder. This is the historic older part of the Maryland State House, dating back to the Revolutionary War. George Washington walked through those doors. Thomas Jefferson walked through those doors. Both, of course, were slave owners. An incredible amount of Maryland's racial history is contained within these four walls. Actually, just outside the door, there long stood a statue honoring uh, Roger Tawney, the Chief Justice, a Maryland native who wrote the infamous Dred Scott decision. There was a plaque on the wall here up until just two or three years ago honoring both Confederate and Union soldiers from Maryland, including a small Confederate flag. Just in the last couple of years, that has been removed. The Tawny statue is gone. Frederick Douglass was in this building as well, uh, late 19th century, and of course, it was his Bible that was used today. From, for some perspective on the importance of this occasion, and the governorship of Westmore. And when it comes to Maryland racial history, we spoke with University of Maryland political science professor Cheryl Laird. You know, you want to be careful because I don't ever want to make anybody feel like they have a lot of weight on their shoulders, right? Like it's hard when you are embodying so much, like so much history is kind of wrapped up in who you are, what you're representing. Um, I think one, he is a signal of kind of the future of American politics, right? He's kind of part of that cohort of elected officials who are people of color that are going into newer positions of power that we haven't really seen them in. So for him to have come into office in a post-Obama world, for Harris to be at the VP position in federal government, for Hakeem Jeffries now to be the minority leader in the House of Representatives, I think um, are all signals about the direction in which representation is, is going and that it doesn't have to be simply um, majority minority districts that elect people into positions of power. I think also when we look at the history of the United States, um, we should really be thinking about, you know, the tumultuous pieces of that that have really been formative to the African American experience in the U.S. and, and that Maryland is part of that story. You know, I'm a faculty member at the University of Maryland. Maryland is a land grant institution that was, you know, created on a plantation that had enslaved individuals on it. Um, it is an institution where the Harriet Tubman Women and Gender Studies Department exists. They just named two uh, door, they named a dorm after the two first Black students who attended the University of Maryland. There was a Frederick Douglass statue on Hornbake Mall. Um, it is very much um, something that has been a part of Maryland and the nation. You know, when I think about this, when I look at my students, you know, I have 18 to 21 year olds typically on average in my class. Uh, those individuals have come of age where Obama was president when they were children. They don't even remember some of the historic nature of the commentary at that time. They're like, yeah, Obama was president and today is Friday. Like, <laughs> it's, it's a very normal thinking for them. Um, and, you know, we're seeing a tapering off um, in some of the conservatism that we would see as people age with the millennial demographic. Um, so I think that that is kind of this really interesting intersection that Moore was in to be able to be successful because you have people who have now seen 
representation from people of color in higher levels of office who were adults at the time that those people have come into those positions. Maryland is a is a tep, often a blue state, at least at the federal level, and red and blue from time to time, depending on what's going on in the gubernatorial office. But that in effect that 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 has kind of given people information on what that looks like and how candidates can be. And I think West Moore is definitely you know, from more of probably an, an Obama type of space with his um, Black politic, I think, in terms of what he kind of presents as to people. And now MPT's Nancy Yamada standing by out front of the State House with some of the uh, spectators for the outdoor inaugural ceremony. Nancy. And you know what's amazing is we've been out here for other inaugurations and it's been freezing, but it's a beautiful 51 degrees right now and I think all the spectators can appreciate it. I want to show you, just give you a glimpse. We're right of center stage and we're actually with a lot of the dignitaries, family, friends, but there's also a lot of people who are uh, just citizens of Annapolis who came down on their lunch break and this area, they just want to witness history. Um, and also, uh, I want to introduce you to two people who want to witness history. I want to introduce you to Marcus Ward and Daniel Fountainberry. Um, they actually flew in from, Marcus, you're from Mississippi and you're from Montreal, right? Yeah. And tell me your connection to West. So we've known West nearly 25 years now. We met in the Ford Foundation PPI A Fellows Program in Princeton University. Wow. And at that time, did you have any clue that your friend would be the next governor of Maryland? He was always someone who cared deeply about people and wanted every person to have the chance to fulfill their dreams, to be the best version of themselves. He was always patriotic and his, and his love and his care for community was so strong. He was just so driven to make a difference anywhere he could with anyone he can. And so it's, it's, I'm, I'm not surprised that he's here, but he was always focused on impacting people's lives, whoever was in front of him. Marcus, is that, was that your take on it? No doubt about it. I mean, you look around and you see this crowd out here today and the history that's being made here in the state of Maryland. You know, we need more West Moors in this world because he's a faithful man, he's a family man. As Daniel said, he's a community man. He's always exhibited all of those traits and the characters of the swearing in, that he, the oath of office that he just took, he exhibits every one of those elements. The reason why so many people are here is because he's touched so many people's lives. He always focused on service wherever he was. And so when you see all these people here, so many people have a personal connection to him because he's been giving back since he was in high school, since he was in college, you know, after he was a Rhodes Scholar, when he volunteered in the Army. And he always focused on the people in front of them and getting to know everyone's story because he always cared about everyone's story. And so it was never this, I'm going to go off and do these things. What can I do for the people in front of me right now? Okay, now I think people might want to know a little bit about the personal side of Westmore. What can you tell us about, like, what was he like back then? Like, Well, he's fun. He's fun. He has a personality. As you see, he's very infectious. And so once you meet Wes, you know, it's an instant connection. As Daniel said, he connects with people on a level that's deeper in an instant than you can ever imagine. He's, he's fun. He, 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 knows how, he knows how to make a joke. He likes to sing. He's a fun guy. He knows how to unwind. He plays ball pretty good. Very good. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your stories with us and letting us learn a little bit more about our new governor. Jeff, back to you. Nancy, thank you. The new governor has been an Army officer. He has been a CEO. He's been a White House fellow, a Rhodes Scholar. When does he decide that he wanted to enter politics. We talked to him about that. I have been working on these issues for much of my adult life. You know, I, I had a chance to lead soldiers in combat. I had a chance to run a successful small business where we were focusing on helping first generation students go to and through college. And I had a chance to lead one of the largest poverty fighting organizations in this country. Uh, and I'm really proud of the work that I did in all of those different places. But the same thing that I thought uh, you know, back when I was uh, 19 or 20 years old, uh, it's real to this day. If you're not actually moving the levers of policy, you, are, you will repeatedly find yourself cleaning up the debris that comes from broken systems. And that's the thing I think we're going to have a unique opportunity in the state of Maryland to push on, to say we can be a state that will, is going to be more competitive, but also more more equitable, and that's not a choice. We have to do both, and we have to make sure that we're not leaving people behind in that process. We have got to build a growth mindset 
in the state of Maryland. But it's got to be a growth mindset that makes sure that it is participatory, that we're getting more people that are engaged, more people that are involved, getting people back into the workforce. And so when we say we're going to focus on work and wages and wealth, when we're talking about things like work, it means having job retraining and job reskilling, having an education system that's teaching our young people how not just to be employees, but how to be employers, making sure we're investing in trade programs and apprenticeship programs and not looking at the only indicator of success for a high school is what is your four-year college acceptance rates when that's not going to be the path for every student like it wasn't my path. When we're talking about wages, it means making sure people are getting paid fair wages for the work that they are doing. And we have to end the days where people are working jobs, and in some cases multiple jobs, and living below the poverty line. And we've got to focus on wealth, ownership. That means just the, the ability to own more than you owe, the ability to pass something off to your children besides debt. If we can create that kind of framework, we, it is the best, the most effective, and the most permanent way we can deal with the issue of generational poverty that still continues to plague our society. The office of Lieutenant Governor of Maryland has no defined duties, so what will new Lieutenant Governor Aruna Miller focus on? Our Nancy Amata spoke to the new LG. You're a self-described accidental politician who's now going to devote the next four years of your life to the state of Maryland as Lieutenant Governor. If you would talk about the significance of this moment, both personally and professionally. Thank you so much, Nancy, for the question. Look, uh, this moment is uh, quite profound in my life. I can tell you that as well as Governor Moore's life. Look, our hope is that this election sends a message to all Marylanders that diversity and inclusivity is our greatest strength and that everyone belongs here and everyone can achieve here in the state of Maryland. And really, uh, the ultimate thing that I would like to say about that is that each of us has the power to make tomorrow better than it is today. And that's what I hope that the, um, our election is able to send the message to other Marylanders and, you know, to really encourage young people to seek a life in public service. For those who are not aware of your background, you're a transportation engineer. You've spent, uh, you spent two terms in the House of Delegates. You're also a wife and mother. How have these roles and experiences, how will they shape uh, your approach to the job and how do you view the role of lieutenant governor? So absolutely, you know, from my professional experience, from my life experience, being a mother, being an engineer and being a former legislator, I hope that I can bring the best of me to this job as lieutenant governor, because ultimately that's what Marylanders deserve, the best of each of us. And that's what I hope to bring. The empathy that I gained um, throughout my life for those that haven't been along the same path as me to understand their trials, their tribulations, their pain, the challenges that face that they face, and what can we do together to come up with the solutions so they can have a better life. So that's what I hope to bring to this office. And speaking of which, you really you crisscrossed this state over the last year, talking to Marylanders about their concerns. And what did you learn uh, from these people that you spoke with? What do you think people are uh, wanting your administration to accomplish? Um, and what are your legislative priorities? I'm spending one year with Marylanders across the state. One thing we learned is. Look, no matter which side of the aisle Marylanders are coming from, they all want to have a Maryland that works better for everyone. They want a Maryland where people are not left behind that, that have been traditionally in the past. They want to make sure there's equity available for everyone to achieve, you know, the opportunities, their dreams that they have for themselves and their family and their loved ones. That's what we learn. And there's a lot of different ways in which we can achieve this. And, you know, I would say that looking forward into um, this tremendous opportunity to serve as a lieutenant governor is continuing to listen to Marylanders, right? Doesn't stop right after the election or as soon as the election is over. This has got to continue. We want to bring all the diverse voices to the table to think about ideas and initiatives that we can make Maryland a better place. We're about five minutes away from the beginning of the outdoor ceremony. MPT Sue Copen is standing by. 
Thanks, Jeff. Joining me right now is uh, another face from the crowd who is a familiar face, I believe, to someone on the podium there. Joining me is Sharon Cornish Scott from the Eastern Shore. Where on the Eastern Shore? I grew up in Cambridge, Maryland, and I'm always connected to Maryland because of the beautiful Eastern Shore. <laughs> And tell me about your relationship with uh, the, the governor, the governor now. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's a friend. I um, have just recently acquainted myself with him since, since being elected as governor. He, uh, he, he sure finds a very good connection to the Eastern Shore. He loves the um, Harriet Tubman, um, you know, all the things he with the, with the museum there and uh, also with the Frederick Douglass heritage, so he speaks highly of that, yeah. Have you had to, an opportunity to talk to him before or after he was elected? Uh, yes, I spoke to him after he was elected, which was a joy, a very lovely person. Usually a lot of times you find with politicians, you know, they don't have time, or, but he was very warm, very understanding, and, and just, he's ready, he's ready for this. When did you decide you were gonna come out here and be here for this special day? Oh, once he was elected, I knew I had to be here. I definitely had to be here today. And what are your hopes for his time in office? That he'll move uh, Maryland forward in a positive way, uh, not only on the Eastern Shore, but all through Maryland. It needs, some, it needs a lot of uh, care and attention. I believe he's ready to give that. Yeah. So the weather today has to be noted because generally speaking, inaugurations are either very, very yeah. cold or very yeah. snowy. Yeah. The last time I was here, it was freezing, and, and then it started snowing. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> but, but I still, you know, I still just stayed through it. Yeah, but it was. But the weather is lovely today. And as Maryland's first black governor, what does, what does that message say to you? Well, it shows a long time coming. You know, people who struggled for voting rights in Selma, and it's, it's, a, it's a proud day for a lot of people because, you know, we got someone who cares, you know, not only for his own people, but for the state of Maryland. Yeah, yeah. Sharon, thank you. Oh, Jeff, yeah. to be here. back to you. Sue Copen, thank you very much. Joined by MPT correspondent Charles Robinson. Now, Charles, rumor going around Oprah Winfrey. Yes, in there was a signing of Oprah Winfrey. Uh, what's very interesting is because she was one of the early endorsers of Westmore. And obviously, when you get an endorsement by Oprah, you know, you can talk about a book club, but this was a very big deal to have her. And, and she knows Baltimore. She knows Maryland. So she's aware of all the historical context that surrounding this particular event. Let's talk about some of the historical context that I know you're interested in. We're standing here in this Revolutionary War era building that has seen so much history. Um, this date, as, as uh, Sue's friend indicated, uh, a little late in coming, perhaps. Maryland has a black governor. The people whose portraits are on the wall here may not have expected that. Well, these are the lords of Baltimore, literally. Um, you and I talked earlier about a specific, the second Lord Baltimore. In that photo, or that painting, if you will, there is a image of the state of Maryland with a young man who doesn't actually get to Maryland. Next to him is an enslaved person who is holding a chicken. And how apropos that an enslaved person is on the walls here and we have a black governor. History continues to be made. This building continues to stand. Let's take a quick look outside to see where the process of beginning the outdoor ceremony stands. We see people gathering on the podium. The Chief Justice of the state's new Supreme Court will re-administer that long oath of office. It seemed like there was a, a, a nod and a wink about maybe shortening that thing before four years from now. That'll be repeated. There will be uh, remarks from the new lieutenant governor. There will be an inaugural address. And if uh, media legend Oprah Winfrey is here, uh, perhaps might say a word. I'm not certain of that, <laughs> but I can tell you this. One of the things that you're likely to note is the fact that the Morgan State Choir, which is literally the ambassador for this state, will be actually performing during this inauguration. But remind yourself, he will be looking out on a crowd, and in that crowd is a statue of Thurgood Marshall, who challenged, if you will, 
the laws in the state that did not allow African Americans to attend colleges. And he will reference that in his speech. We have seen some excerpts. And in those excerpts, what you will hear is part of his vision that he has been championing all along this process. I think the other thing that's very interesting to me is the number of folks who have shown up. Obviously, a majority of the Maryland uh, congressional delegation is here. That includes Kwaisi Mfumi, Steny Hoyer, Dutch Rupersberg, and others. And also, you will also see a number of county executives and mayors. This is one of those events you don't want to miss. There's the statue of Thurgood Marshall, who was denied admission to the University of Maryland Law School. He was born in Baltimore, eventually went on, of course, to found the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, win important victories. The State Court of Appeals building used to stand where you're seeing that crowd. He argued successfully there and later became the nation's first black justice of the United States Supreme Court. I want to talk a little bit about some of the context that we have around here. Obviously, you know, this morning he went down to the docks where enslaved individuals were brought. In fact, probably the most famous one was written about was from Alex Haley's book, Roots. Uh, we know that individual now is Quinta Kente. And understand this, all around this city, there are people who are taking note. One of the things I'm always reminded of the little things, and one of those is there is a black uh, enclave called Hidden Beach. Hidden Beach was where Frederick Douglass was planning to retire, but he died before his retirement. But uh, many famous African Americans stayed in the song. It's less than five miles from where we are. We're around the corner from the Banneker Douglas Museum, which chronicles many of the uh, intricacies of African American life in Annapolis. Think about this. There was a segregated beach here called Cars Beach. And Cars Beach had some of the, the most iconic black musicians of our time, going all the way back to Duke Ellington, to some of the more contemporary stuff. James Brown spent a week here at Cars Beach. And that's in the whole context of he's here. And just over our shoulder here is a plaque to Matthew Alexander Henson. I knew about him because there was an elementary school down the street from me that was named after Henson. Henson was one of the first individuals to make it to the North Pole. And when you think in the context, we have an African-American governor, but he isn't just an African-American governor. He's, he's going to try and chart a new vision for where the state should go. Well, and let's pick up on that because he is uh, new to politics has pretty good track record in politics so far. Mm -hmm. uh, and he brings a team of largely Annapolis outsiders. We're a week into the state legislative session. The governor's budget is due Friday. That's two days from now. Right. It's a quick turn. Right. Well, one of the things that you get when you're a new governor is you get whatever the old governor <laughs> says, I think these are the priorities. Obviously, we have a new budget secretary, and she's probably tweaked some things, and we're going to see some of that in this process, and we will get the first glimpse of what his priorities are by what he funds in the budget. Now, don't get me wrong, we have seen supplemental budgets before, and we will see probably some along with her Bertha. and here's the good news. He's got a budget surplus. It's, it's nice to have when you're a governor when you have a budget surplus and you can find things that you want to fund. Well, and there are a lot of people with a lot of uh, needs. There is Oprah Winfrey, former Governor O'Malley, uh, former Judge Katie Curran O'Malley, and on the uh, far upper left, Michael Steele, the former Lieutenant Governor. Um, the, uh, the legislative process, it's four-year terms here. And the first year of a cycle, Charles, tends to maybe not be the most productive unless there's a big emergency. A lot of finding out where the votes are on different issues, a lot of fact-finding with the heavy lift coming later. But one thing that Mr. Moore has indicated that he will be pushing in this session is the idea of a year of service 
for young people graduating from high schools, optional, but a paid year. Um, and we believe the process of bringing out the new governor may be underway. Uh, but that'll be an interesting process to follow. I think the other thing is some of the policy issues. You know, um, during this last session, there was an effort to uh, deal with abortion. It was tabled. There will also be a cannabis issue. And he has indicated, the governor now, that he wants to have more than less. From our vantage point, we can see the new governor is walking through the state house, soon to come out on the front steps to begin the inaugural ceremony. Three governors, former governors in attendance, yes. Governor Larry Hogan, Governor uh, Paris Glendening, Governor Martin O'Malley. And as Charles said, numerous members of Congress, county officials, I saw uh, Calvin Ball, the Howard County Executive, Johnny Olszewski, the Baltimore County Executive. And here is the new governor, Wes Moore, and the state's new first lady, Dawn Moore. Executive Stuart Pittman will be the MC for the outdoor ceremonies. Wow, what a beautiful day it is today. If we hadn't referenced this, Charles in the past, gubernatorial inauguration days in mid-January have, have brought mid-January weather. This is mid-50s and sunny and a beautiful day to be outside. I can tell you that I have frozen on <laughs> many of those occasions. Uh, including during the last one with Larry Hogan, where in the middle of that process we had a snow. I don't, want, I don't know what you want to call it, but this today is one of those. I think it's it's apropos that his two kids are there. We haven't had kids in the governor's mansion in years, and as you said earlier, you know, they struck a deal. We're going to get a puppy. I don't know what the name of the puppy is going to be or what kind of puppy, but let's put it this way. You better hurry up and get that dog in that house, if you will. We can be sure there's going to be a lot of planning. Uh, Mr. Moore is a military veteran, leaves little to chance, is uh, a planner in the long term and the short term. And we haven't talked about his political future, but this is day one of his career as an elected official. And Welcome. the future is wide open. Here's Mr. Pittman. Welcome to the inauguration of the 10th Lieutenant Governor, the 63rd Governor of the great state of Maryland. If you happen to have a seat, please be seated. My name is Stuart Pittman. I am the 10th and current county executive of the best place for all, the crossroads of Maryland, and the seat of state government in Arundel County. I have been asked to facilitate this historic occasion to introduce our speakers, encourage them to be brief, and model that behavior myself. A master of ceremonies has a task to complete and must hide his or her emotions. I apologize in advance for my failure to do that. This is a joyous day. 
I have a handkerchief and I intend to use it. <laughs> you see, I, <clears throat> I have deep roots in this county and this state. And today has been a very long time coming. I am a direct descendant of a man named Dr. George Hume Stewart, who arrived here from Scotland in 1721, purchased land, and made his fortune in the tobacco industry on the backs of enslaved men, women, children from Africa. Dr. Stewart was also a politician, serving as mayor of Annapolis and as a delegate to the colony's General Assembly. He lived in a house on land that later became the site of Government House, the governor's residence. He lived right there. Three hundred years later, on September 8, 2021, when I stood a few steps from that house behind a podium alongside a magnificent new friend named Wes Moore, in the presence of his wife Dawn, his mother Joy, his grandmother Mama Wynn, his sisters Shani and Nikki, and my daughter Jessie. The magic of what this day could mean, the healing that this election could offer, was presented as if by a higher power, like a portal to a brighter future. But I did not join Team Moore on that day simply to send a message to my ancestors, as sweet as that message may be. I joined for the same reason most of Maryland joined. I, like you, was looking for a leader who would listen, a human being to remind us what it means to be human. It's just that simple. We found one, and that is why we're here today. Watching Wes build the team that catapulted him from the single-digit support he had when I endorsed him <laughs> to the most votes of any governor in the history of our state. <laughs> was a window into what will begin tomorrow morning when the crowds disperse and the work begins. Maryland will learn that we really can get both heart and mind in one body. That we can grow our economy and leave no one behind. That work, wages, and wealth are still the path to progress. And that government is not the source of our problems. It's the tool that works when we sharpen it Sharpen it with the world-class talent that will serve in this administration. We are such a lucky state today. But we aren't here just to inaugurate Wes Moore. We have a dynamic duo coming to town. We are welcoming back to Annapolis, back to state government service, former delegate and soon-to-be Lieutenant Governor Aruna Miller. A woman who brought an infectious joy and energy and confidence to the campaign and whose experience and wisdom will carry this administration through whatever challenges our times present. Finally, I think it is filling 
fitting, I'm sorry, fitting. It's filling too, isn't it? <laughs> that after so many months of Wes and Aruna listening to us, that we show them that we have also heard their words, particularly the four words that appeared on thousands of yard signs all across our state. You know the ones I'm talking about. I will count to three, and then we will shout those words together three times. We want them to be heard at the very top of the Capitol Dome so that they hover there forever and remind all who enter the commitment we have made to the people of Maryland. Are you ready? One, two, three. Leave no one behind. Leave no one behind. Leave no one behind. Well done, y'all. OK, let's, uh, let's get this ceremony started. First, a warning and an invitation. The warning is that immediately after the governor is sworn in, you will hear a 19-gun salute and a flyover. It's OK. These are traditional demonstrations of honor and respect. The invitation is to greet the governor and lieutenant governor immediately after the ceremony here in the State House Rotunda they will spend the first part of their afternoon greeting as many of you as possible. Did you know that? Good. <laughs> now, if you're seated and are able, please stand as the Joint Color Guard comprised of the Maryland State Police, Maryland Transportation Authority Police, Maryland Transit Administration Police, Maryland Natural Resources Police, and the Maryland Capitol Police presents the colors. Please remain standing for Severna Park High School's The Voice Top 8 Superstar, Parajita Bastola. So, uh, singing our national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner, and after that, the invocation will be delivered by Bishop Dante Hickman, Sr., pastor of the Southern Baptist Church in Baltimore. And the Pledge of Allegiance will be led by James Moore, son of Governor Moore and Mrs. Moore. Please remain standing after the pledge for the departure of colors. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light What so proudly we hailed At the twilight's last gleaming Whose broad stripes and bright stars Through the pair of this fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets regular the bombs bursting in air came proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star spangled banner yet away or the land of the free and the
Shall we bow and shall we pray? O Lord, our God, how excellent is your name in all the earth. How we thank you for life, health, and strength, and for things being as well as they are. And we thank you for giving us this beautiful day to witness this historical and transformational occasion to inaugurate, consecrate, and celebrate Westmore and Aruna Miller as the new governor and lieutenant governor of the state of Maryland. We're so grateful for how you've blessed our state. You've blessed us with more good than bad, more unity than division, more opportunity than obstruction, and now you've blessed us with more, Wes Moore. Thank you for the content of his character. Thank you for the clarity of his mind and the quality of his spirit. And we thank you for blessing us with Aruna Miller. Thank you for her authenticity, her consistency, and her vibrancy and vitality of heart, mind, and spirit. And now we ask that you would undergird them as they lead, lift, legislate, and leave no one behind. Dispatch your angels to cover the governor and the first lady, Don Moore, their children and their family. Cover the lieutenant governor and her husband, David Miller, their children and their family. Protect them from all hurt, harm, and danger. Direct them in your wisdom and in your love. Correct them by your grace and your mercy. May their years in service be filled with more blessing than stressing and more success than mess. And now, Lord, so many Marylanders have been inspired by the ideas and the ideals of Wes Moore. We admire his courage, his charisma, and his collaborative spirit. And so we thank you for giving him the victory of the vote. But now we ask that you would give him the victory of his vision. Give him the victory to improve educational, environmental, economical, and ecological systems of our state so that no one is left behind. You paved the way through liberationists like Harriet Tubman. You paved the way through astronomists like Benjamin Banneker. You paved the way through abolitionists like Frederick Douglass, through jurists like Thurgood Marshall, through activists like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., now guard and guide Wes Moore and Aruna Miller as they strive to make Maryland the leading state for opportunity, equity, diversity, dignity, safety, and prosperity for all. We give you praise in advance for all the successes of this administration. We give you praise in advance in the face of our spiritual adversary whose adversity couldn't stop this opportunity. We give you praise on these steps of the state capitol that undocumented enslaved hands built so that we could lift as we climb. We praise you because we know that the steps of a good man and a good woman are ordered by the Lord. We praise you because we know no weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and forever. We pray this prayer to you collectively from our respective faith traditions and convictions. And I pray this prayer in the name of the one who saved my soul, in the name of the one who made me whole, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Please continue standing and put your right hand over your heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Wow. <laughs> Please be seated.
I was going to say, let's give a uh, round of applause to our great talent, Parajita Bastola, for that amazing anthem. And I will say that. But how about a round of applause for James Moore, leading us in the national anthem. <laughs> and thank you, Bishop Dante, for bringing faith to this moment. And we extend a special thank you to our Maryland's Joint Law Enforcement Color Guard. Now, to administer the oath of office to the 10th, Lu 10th Lieutenant Governor of Maryland, Aruna Miller, I am honored to introduce the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Maryland, the Honorable Matthew J. Fader. At the conclusion of the swearing in, America the Beautiful will be sung by the most highly acclaimed musical organization of the United States Naval Academy, one of America's premier choral ensembles, the United States Naval Academy Women's and Men's Glee Club, under the direction of Dr. Aaron Smith. left hand on the Gita and raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Aruna Katragata Miller. I, Aruna Katragata Miller. Do swear. Do swear. That I will support the Constitution. That I will support the Constitution. Of the United States. Of the United States. And that I will be faithful. And that I will be faithful. And bear true allegiance. And true, bear true allegiance. To the state of Maryland. To the state of Maryland and support the Constitution and support the Constitution and laws thereof and laws thereof and that I will and that I will to the best of my skill and judgment to the best of my skill and judgment diligently and faithfully diligently and faithfully without partiality or prejudice without partiality or prejudice execute the office execute the office of Lieutenant Governor of Maryland of Lieutenant Governor of Maryland according to the Constitution and laws according to the constitutions and laws of this state of this state and that i will not and that i will not directly or indirectly directly or indirectly receive the profits receive the profits or any part of the profits or any part of the profits of any other office of any other office during the term during the term of my acting of my acting as lieutenant governor of maryland as lieutenant governor of maryland congratulations <laughs> thank you <laughs>
Thank you. To the United States Naval Academy Glee Club, please be seated. At this time, please welcome Mina, Chloe, and Sasha Miller, who will introduce their mother, Lieutenant Governor Aruna Miller. Family, friends, and Marylanders. My name is Mina. I'm Chloe. And my name is Sasha, and we are deeply honored to introduce the next Lieutenant Governor of Maryland, our mom, Aruna Miller. <laughs> my mom raised us with a simple philosophy. When the universe presents you with an opportunity, say yes. But let me tell you, as an eight-year-old kid, it was not so easy to say yes to knocking on strangers' doors on a rainy Saturday to ask them who they were voting for, or standing outside metro stations at 7 a.m. trying to hand out information to half-asleep commuters. <laughs> Although I did a lot of complaining over the years, sorry, mommy, I'm grateful for the moments where you challenged me to say yes. Your encouragement has made us believe anything is possible. But my mom doesn't only welcome opportunities, she welcomes challenges. For instance, the uh, Lieutenant Governor used to be terrified of public speaking. For those who have seen her speak, I know, it's hard to believe. Um, but instead of shying away from it, she faced her fears head on and took a stand-up comedy class. I won't subject you to the jokes that were part of her routine. I don't know if they're ready for prime time yet. Uh, but watching her on stage helped me realize that it didn't matter. My mom's a force to be reckoned with. She's a woman who understands that growth springs from discomfort. Years later, I watched my mom, a woman of color and an immigrant, run for elected office on a ticket with Governor Moore. Um, together, forging a past so many, uh, for so many underrepresented people to see themselves in our government. I am so proud to be her daughter, and I know she will continue to advocate for the inclusion of all Marylanders during her time as Lieutenant Governor. My mom has always been my hero. Oh, I said I wasn't gonna cry. <laughs> it is her commitment to public service that led me to become a public, a public school teacher Watching her, <laughs> watching her lead with compassion grounds me in what is most important. I move through the world the way that I do because of her. She leads with values. She will say yes when it matters most and that is how she will serve the people. Today feels like a dream and it was only possible because of all of you that chose to say yes. So thank you, Marilyn, for saying yes to Wes Moore. Thank you for saying yes to my mom, Aruna Miller. Thank you for saying yes to a better future for our state. It is my honor to share my hero with Marilyn. Please join us in welcoming Maryland's Lieutenant Governor, my mom, Aruna Miller, to the stage. <laughs> Mommy loves you so much. <laughs> yes, they still call me mommy, as you heard. I am so proud of the strong, smart, beautiful souls that you have become. 12 years ago, I was sworn in to the same state house as a delegate from District 15, where I served for eight years. They say you can never go home again. And I say my presence here today is proof. Yes, you can. Because when you want to serve the people, you can always go home. Good afternoon, Marilyn. What an amazing day in our great state. 
what about this weather, huh? Is it beautiful or what? So I just want to remind you, yesterday it was raining. Today it's 60 degrees and sunny. Tomorrow it's supposed to rain again. So Marylanders, you should know destiny is on our side. <laughs> To my friend and Maryland's 63rd governor, Wes Moore, I am humbled to join you on this journey to serve the state we love for the people we love in a place we call home. To the First Lady Dawn Moore and the First Family, we look forward to the joy you will bring to the government house, along with the new puppy you were promised. <laughs> right, Jamie? <laughs> and Mia, that new puppy. <laughs> to all our federal, state, local, municipal elected leaders, justices, National Guard, family, friends, mentors, and Marylanders, welcome. I am Maruna Miller, and I thank you for your trust and confidence in me to be your 10th Lieutenant Governor of Maryland. I arrived to the United States when I was seven years old. And I will never forget my first day of school. I remember walking in, it was in Poughkeepsie, New York, walked into the classroom, looked, looked at all my class, classmates, none of them looked like me, and I couldn't speak a word of English. But I wanted to fit in. So where is the best gathering place other than the cafeteria? So when we went to the cafeteria, I had a plan. I was gonna do exactly what everyone else was doing. So I ate American food for the first time. I drank cold milk for the first time in my life. I was feeling pretty good. I thought, okay, I think I won over all these classmates of mine. They're my friends now. Walked back to the classroom and proceeded to vomit all over the desk. <laughs> I was mortified. My teacher called my mom. My mom came to pick me up. And on the drive home, I told her, I want to go back to grandma who raised me in India. I hate cold milk too, mom, by the way. <laughs> by the time we got home, we heard a knock on the door. And I opened the door and outside, standing in the snow, was one of my classmates with a stack full of paintings in her hand. Paintings that had hearts, smiley faces, little faces with tears coming down. And it was in that moment I knew I belonged in this great country. It took an educator to teach what I believe is one of the most important qualities of a human being, and that is to have empathy and compassion for others. It wasn't just the first day of school where I felt I didn't belong. In fact, I would say I spent most of my life trying to fit into a space that didn't have me in mind. As an immigrant growing up in a new country, or as a female engineer in a male-dominated field, as an Indian American legislator in a legislature that looked nothing like me, it took me a long time to realize that it was never about needing to fit into a space created by others. It was always about having the courage to be my authentic self in every space. But throughout our history, too many of our communities have been denied opportunities to live fully, freely, and to be their authentic selves. Too many people have been left behind. From our black and brown communities seeking to feel safe in their own skin, from women who are fighting for their autonomy over their own bodies. People wanting to love who they love and be who they are in their lived identity. Families and children struggling to survive without adequate access to food, housing, education, transportation, and health care. Governor Moore and I see you. We hear you. We will fight for you. We will address the inequities of the past and build a Maryland where everyone will thrive. Because you see, our fortunes are tied together in ensuring that we create a state that we grow equitably. 
It will take all of us together to achieve this vision. Together with you, we will write the next chapter of Maryland's history, a chapter that will be filled with real-time heroes like you, you who advocates every day for policies that right the wrongs, you who never gives up on the underdogs to be champions and achievers, you who believes that each of us has the power within us to make tomorrow better than today. My story would not be possible without recognizing the heroes in my life. They inspire me to be uh, better and to try harder. So thank you to my husband, David Miller. You've made my life a fairy tale. <laughs> to my mom and dad who took a leap of faith to come to this country because they believed in the promise of America. To my siblings, you were the best part of my childhood and I thank you and I love you for always being there. And of course, also to my daughters that I recognize, I am so proud and they become my favorite type of people, taxpayers. <laughs> <laughs> to my family, friends, and mentors, thank you for never ever giving up on me. To Marylanders, thank you for trusting me to help lead our state into the future. And to Governor Moore, from the moment we met, I knew you were going to be the next governor of Maryland. And apparently, so did 1,293,944 other Marylanders. <laughs> and saying yes to you when you asked me to be your running mate was life-changing. Yes is a tiny but powerful word. When we say yes, we do more, we love more, we create more. Saying yes is to trust the universe has bigger plans for us, one that we can only understand with hindsight. And now, here we are, Governor. It was an honor to run by your side, and it will be the greatest honor of my life to serve by your side. For every single person uh, across the state, from Mountain Maryland to the Eastern Shore, from Baltimore City to Southern Maryland, and every space in between, you belong here. This is your home. This is our home. Yes, this is our Maryland. <laughs> Thank you, Lieutenant Governor Miller. We are so ready for your inspired leadership. Now, it is my pleasure to present to you one of the nation's most prestigious university choral ensembles, the Morgan State University Choir, under the direction of Dr. Eric Conway, performing God Bless America. I 
light with the light from above from the mountains to the prairies to the oceans wide with love god bless america it's my home sweet Thank you, Dr. Conway, and the amazing Oregon State University Choir for that performance. To administer the oath of office to the 63rd governor of the state of Maryland, Wes Moore, I once again welcome to the podium the Honorable Matthew J. Fader. The swearing in will be followed immediately by honors and the 19 gun salute by soldiers from the Maryland Army National Guard. Following the salute, please look skyward to see our Maryland Air National Guard 175th Wing's finest coming to us from Warfield Air National Guard Base in Middle River, Maryland. your left hand on the Bible, raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Wesley Watende Omari Moore. I, Wesley Watende Omari Moore. Do swear. Do swear. That I will support the Constitution. That I will support the Constitution. Of the United States. Of the United States. And that I will be faithful. And that I will be faithful. And bear true allegiance. And bear true allegiance. To the state of Maryland. To the state of Maryland. And support the Constitution and support the Constitution and laws thereof and laws thereof and that I will and that I will to the best of my skill and judgment to the best of my skill and judgment diligently and faithfully diligently and faithfully without partiality or prejudice with our par without partiality or prejudice execute the office execute the office of governor of Maryland of governor of Maryland according to the Constitution, according to the Constitution, and laws of this state, and laws of this state, and that I will not, and that I will not, directly or indirectly, directly or indirectly, receive the profits, receive the profits, or any part of the profits, or any part of the profits, of any other office, of any other office, during the term, during the term, of my acting, of my acting, as Governor of Maryland, as Governor of Maryland. Congratulations, Governor Moore.
We've got a lot of hugging going on up here. Congratulations, Governor. Okay. <laughs> Governor brought a friend. I would like to introduce, or two. <laughs> I would like to introduce <clears throat> Lieutenant Colonel Jaime Martinez a retired United States soldier and great friend of the governor. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jaime Martinez. I'm a retired United States Army soldier, and I am humbled to participate in such a historic day. Honored to say a few words about my friend, Governor Moore. Wes and I met in Afghanistan in 2005 during Operation Enduring Freedom on a hot, dusty airstrip and coast along the Pakistan border. When he reported to our unit, the 82nd Airborne Division, where we were tasked with securing Afghanistan for its first ever legislative elections, while building the local economy and extending the rule of law. The pace of combat operations during that tour involved constant contact with a relentless enemy. That deployment was challenging in ways few can understand with losses and sacrifices of many great Americans in harsh and austere conditions, all while continuing the mission. You know, Wes did not need to go to Afghanistan in 2005 to 2006. We all know that he had attended a military academy. He had also graduated from Johns Hopkins, where he had proved to be a standout student, and then attended Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar. He was a kind of guy with unlimited potential, and he could have chosen to do anything with his life and succeeded. But Wes also had taken an oath of service, and he saw it as his duty to raise his hand. Send me, he said, I will go. And from day one, he was all in. Often, I would walk into the Tactical Operations Center in the, middle of the, in the middle of the night, and Wes would be there, evaluating reports and providing critical analysis while assisting with battle plans, in effect, to lead our information operations in an area four times the size of Maryland. Or he would be out on patrol, engaging the local populace and assessing the effectiveness of our campaign while targeting the constant threat and reporting back to command. There was no rest. Wes never shrank from his duty, and his commitment never wavered. He was a soldier, he was a leader, and he was the very best of us and well-respected above his rank. His ideas were critical to our success, and in the fluid battle space of Afghanistan, our higher headquarters took notice and replicated that operational art. Our time in Afghanistan and in the service was guided by the Army's values, loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage. Now, I could tell you how Wes embodies all of them but today I'm gonna to focus on selfless service. You see, selfless service is about putting the welfare of the nation before your own. Selfless service is larger than just one person, where you perform your duty without thought of recognition or personal gain. 
Because in the Army and just as the government and in our local communities, it is never one person that does it all. At the end of the day, it is about your personal, personal commitment to the team. It takes all of us doing everything that they can. And that's how Westmore leads. Now, I've known Wes for a very long time, and I've seen him on difficult days, days when every decision was hard and success was far from guaranteed. And he has risen to the toughest of challenges, and he's volunteered to help again and again. I will go is selfless service. I will help is selfless service. I will run is selfless service. And he did. He decided to run for governor of this great state. He said he wanted Maryland to be a state of service. And that philosophy starts at the top. Westmore's administration will not be defined by only his leadership or the lieutenant governor's. It will be defined by the whole state's worth of leaders, teachers and first responders, elected officials, union leaders, law enforcement officers, parents. Wes has called on every Marylander to serve and to support one another, to leave no one behind, to leave no one behind. He has made this call because he has lived these values himself. In Afghanistan, I saw a leader emerge from the most difficult challenges. And I see that same leader here today. From Afghanistan to Annapolis, Westmore has always, always put serving others before himself to set the example. He has always delivered, and starting today, he is going to deliver as governor. I could not be more prouder. Thank you. God bless. Airborne. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, sorry, Lieutenant Colonel Martinez. <laughs> All right. It is now my great honor to invite forward the beloved American who introduced Wes Moore to America 10 years ago so that she can introduce Wes Moore to us as our 63rd Maryland Governor. Welcome, Ms. Oprah Winfrey. Whoa. Hello, Maryland! I can tell you it is such a joy a joy to be here on this day, and what a joy to be back here in Maryland. I'm back! I have to say, I was just 22 years old when I first came to Maryland. I was starting a new job as a co-anchor of the 6 o'clock news on WJZ-TV. And I left my home in Nashville, and I drove myself here in an Oldsmobile Cutlass to Baltimore. I moved into the third floor at 10109 Windstream Drive, Columbia, Maryland, which at the time was considered this new model city. I was so excited, living away from home for the first time, from my family for the very first time. And as I walked around the city of Baltimore, that first week, I saw the strangest thing. 
their promo campaign was my face on billboards and my face on the backs of buses. My face advertising the six o'clock news with Jerry Turner. Remember Jerry Turner? And a question on the billboards and the buses said, what is an Oprah? <laughs> Honestly, I didn't really know the answer to that myself. When I moved to Maryland, I had no idea really who I was or what an Oprah was. But I will tell you something, Maryland is where I figured it out. The eight years that I lived here were some of the most significant years of my life. I grew up here from a young, naive girl. I truly like had corn growing behind my ears. I was truly green behind the ears and grew into a woman becoming more and more of myself from every challenge and every experience. I found community here at Bethel AME Church every Sunday. I found the freedom to perform and feed my creative spirit. I found my professional calling, sitting alongside Richard Scher for the show, People Are Talking. And though it wasn't the job that I moved here to do, it was the job that sparked my desire to use television to tell stories that would impact people's lives. And I found some of the closest friends of my life here, Maria Shriver and my BFF, Gail King. But most important, in Maryland, I found myself. This state is something special. It's a place where so many others have done and will do exactly what I did. Plant the seeds of their wildest dreams and watch those seeds grow into reality. Maryland is full to the brim with opportunity. It was back then, it is now. And I know that with Wes Moore as your governor, Maryland's best days lie ahead. So let me tell you a little bit about the Wes Moore that I know, the Wes that I'm proud to be standing here with today. Well, I met Wes for the first time in 2010 when I interviewed him about his best-selling book. Y'all read the book, right? <laughs> Everybody's gonna wanna read the book now. I was so impressed even then by his integrity and his wisdom. He was wise beyond his years. He knew who he was and he had a vision for who he intended to be and how he wanted to serve. Though I have to say, I was delightfully surprised when he called me last year on January 6th, as a matter of fact, to tell me that he wanted to serve as governor. And I said, you wanna run for governor in this political climate where everybody is so polarized, where there's such vitriol? Look at what's happening right now as we speak because as he was telling me, I could see the CNN screen behind him, and that's the first I knew of the invasion of the Capitol. So then I turned it on, I go, look at what's happening. You wanna run in this climate? And he said, exactly, exactly. So I said, go for it, and I'll be here if you need me. I always walk away from a conversation with Westmore with a new perspective with new ideas, with a new way of seeing things, a new burst of positive energy. That's what you do for people. And about five years ago, Wes and our now first lady of Maryland, <laughs> Don Moore, had come to my house for dinner and we had a conversation that stayed with me. I still think about that conversation. We were talking about, as we often do at the table, how to live with purpose and meaning and how to continue that into your later years and how to know that you are spending your precious days in a way that you'll be able to look back with pride and have absolutely never any regret. And I remember, Wes, you said to me, because I had 
just recently into the show, and you said, your job title, talk show host, will change. Your titles change throughout your life, you said, but your occupation will also change. But your work, you said, will always be consistent. Wes has had quite a few titles in his life. Arthur, Army Captain, CEO, and now Governor. <laughs> the man has worn many hats, but the work he's done, the work he has always done, that has never changed. It has not changed, not even a little. He has always been committed to helping young people find purpose and direction in their lives. That's why he started a small business in Baltimore that gave a helping hand to college students who needed one. He's always believed that everyone deserves an equal shot at success, an opportunity to live well, to have lives that are meaningful and provide for their families in the way that he's able to provide for James and Mia. That's why he joined the Robin Hood Foundation one of the largest anti-poverty organizations in America, and distributed more than $600 million to families in need. He has always loved our country and believed that our country is worth fighting for. That's why he served as a captain and a paratrooper in the 82nd Airborne Division. So you see, this might be his first day as an elected official. But Wes Moore has been a public service servant his entire adult life. And there's so much more to come. He's just getting started. I once asked Wes what service meant to him, and he told me it's the thing that makes your heart beat a little bit faster. Well, something tells me that is, you prepare to tell us about your vision for a stronger, safer, and more equitable Maryland, a Maryland that leaves no one behind. As you prepare to serve the state that has meant so much to you, I do believe that your heart must be pumping, 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 <laughs> pumping some wild, ecstatic excitement and love for Maryland and all who abide here. It is my honor to introduce you as my friend, to introduce you as someone who I believe in, as a man I truly respect, and a man I so trust. I trust you. I trust your vision. I trust your leadership. And I want you to know you can trust it too. In your new governor, Westmore. Hello, Maryland! God bless you all. God bless you all. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank you for the honor that you have bestowed upon me and Aruna Miller as your, ne as your next Lieutenant Governor. <laughs> President Ferguson, Speaker Adrian Jones, members of the Maryland General Assembly, thank you all. It is an honor to be your partner. And to all of our state workers and all who organized this inauguration, Thank you, it is an honor to be your new colleague. To Governor Hogan, we are grateful and thankful for the kindness that you and your team have shown throughout this entire transition period. Thank you for eight years of great service to a state that we both love.
to my dear friend Oprah Winfrey, <laughs> a Maryland girl at heart. Thank you for your incredibly kind and gracious introduction. It is an honor to be with you today and always, and thank you for always being in my corner. To, uh, to your new first lady. My amazing wife, Dawn, and to, uh, to the new first babies, <laughs> me and James, you are, you are my heart, you are my soul, you're my everything, and I love you. As we stand here today, looking out over Lawyers Mall, and you can see right there the memorial to Justice Thurgood Marshall. It's impossible not to think about our past and our path. We're blocks away from the Annapolis docks, where so many enslaved people arrived in this country against their will. And we are standing in front of a capital that was built by their hands. We have made uneven and unimaginable progress since then, and it is a history that has been created by generations of, generations of people whose own history was lost, stolen, or never recorded. But one thing we know is that right now we are standing here in our history, in our shared history, in our collective history, made by people who over the past two centuries, regardless of their origin story to this state, bought and built a state and a country that works for everybody. And there are two people who are here today who embody that spirit who are sitting right here next to me, two extraordinary women named Hema and Joy. Hema came to this country from India. Joy from Jamaica. Yeah, ma. They immigrated to America with hope in their hearts, not just for themselves, but for future generations. And now, Today, they are sitting here together at the inauguration of their children to become the governor and lieutenant governor of a state that helped to welcome them. Please stand up. Please stand up so everybody can see you both. To Aruna's mom, Ham, and to my mom, Joy. You epitomize everything special about this state. And you are proof that in the state of Maryland, anything is possible. Now, yes, Aruna and my portraits are going to look a little bit different <laughs> from the ones that we've always seen in the Capitol. But that's not the point. This journey has never been about making history. It's about marching forward. Today is not an indictment of the past. Today is a celebration of our collective future. And today, our opportunity to begin this future is so bright, it is blinding. But only if we are intentional, inclusive, and disciplined in confronting challenges, making hard choices, and seizing this opportunity in front of us. Our state is truly remarkable. From my birthplace of Montgomery County, to my adoptive home of Baltimore City, from the sandy beaches of the Eastern Shore to the rolling hills of West. Yeah, go ahead, Eastern Shore. Go ahead and make yourselves known. <laughs> to the rolling hills of Western Maryland 
and everywhere in between. Maryland is home to spectacular natural beauty and dynamic industries and people as talented as they are determined. But the truth is, Maryland is asset rich and strategy poor. And for too long, we have left too many people behind. We know it is unacceptable that while Maryland has the highest median income in the country, one in eight of our children live in poverty. We know it is unacceptable that in the home of some of the best medical institutions on the planet, that more than 250,000 Marylanders lack health coverage. We've been asked to accept that some of us must be left behind and that in order for some to win, it means others must lose. And not only that, we've come to expect that the people who have lost will keep losing. We must refuse to accept that. Instead, I'm asking you to believe that Maryland can be different. I'm asking you to believe that Maryland can be bold. And I'm asking you to believe that in this moment, Maryland can lead. I'm asking you to understand that it is time for our policies to be as bold as our aspirations and to confront the fact that we have been offered false choices. We do not have to choose between a competitive economy and an equitable one. Maryland should not be 43rd in unemployment or 44th in the cost of doing business. We should not tolerate an eight to one racial wealth gap, not because it only hurts certain groups, but because it prevents all of us from reaching our full potential. We can attract and retain top industries like aerospace, like clean energy, like cybersecurity, and raise the minimum wage to $15 to help folks feed their families. <laughs> Maryland can reward entrepreneurs who take bold risks, and provide stability for families in need. Maryland can be the best place in America for employers and employees. It shouldn't be a choice, it isn't a choice, and the path forward requires us to do both of these things together. And there's another false choice we often hear, that people must choose between feeling safe in their own community and feeling safe in their own skin. Over the last eight years, we have seen the rate of violent crime rise, and many Marylanders have grown weary in their faith that governments can actually keep them safe. We can build a police force that moves with appropriate intensity and absolute integrity and full accountability and embrace the fact that we cannot and will not militarize ourselves to safety. We can and we will support our first responders who risk everything to protect us and change the inexcusable fact that Maryland incarcerates more black boys than any other state in this country. We will work with communities from West Baltimore to Westminster to share data so we can keep violent offenders off of our streets and we can welcome people who have earned a second chance back to our communities. I know what it feels like to have handcuffs on my wrists. <laughs> We're not alone. I felt that when I was 11 years old. I also know what it's like to stand with families and mourn the victims of violent crime. We do not have to choose between being a safe state and a just one. Maryland can and we will be both. We're, we're often told that climate change is a problem for the future or something that you only have to worry about if you, live in, if you live in farmlands or in a flood zone. But climate change is an existential threat and it is happening now in our communities. And so confronting climate change represents another chance for Maryland to lead. 
We can and we will be a leader in wind technology, in grid electrification, and in clean transit. We will protect our jewel, the Chesapeake Bay, and address toxic air pollution that chokes our cities, and we will put Maryland on track to generate 100% clean energy by 2035 and create thousands of jobs in the process. <laughs> clean energy will not just be a part of our economy, clean energy will define our economy in Maryland. But that requires everybody, companies, communities, state and local governments, and the people to take bold and decisive action together. And importantly, we do not have to choose between giving our children an excellent education and an equitable one. We will ensure that every single one of our students and every single one of our children knows that this state loves and needs them, and we will create policies that can help them thrive. We will invest in our special education students, our English language learners, our LGBTQIA students, students experiencing homelessness, and every single child who needs a little extra help. And we will see to it that mental and behavioral health challenges do not prevent our children from getting the education that they deserve as well. And while Maryland is home to some of the best and some of the greatest institutions of higher education in this country, something we should be very, very proud of, we must end this myth that young people must attend one of them in order to be successful. That's not the path for every student. To be clear, it wasn't my path. I joined the military when I was 17 years old. I went to a two-year college, and I think things worked out pretty well. <laughs> Every student in Maryland will know that there are paths to their success and their fulfillment. And those paths begin with high quality and highly inclusive schools from pre-K to 12th grade. Now, my own journey started in military school, where I learned one of my core values, service. I went on to lead soldiers in Afghanistan, and my years of service transformed me. My character was strengthened, my vistas were widened, and my leadership was tested. I want every young Marylander of every background and from every community to have the opportunity to serve our state. That's why we will offer a service year option for all high school graduates. A year of service can prepare our young people for their careers and also provide our state with future leaders, public servants that we desperately need. The challenges that we will face will require all of us to answer this call to service. To go out and join the ranks of our teachers and our firefighters, our police officers and our civil servants, our nurses and our union members. You've elected me to serve as your governor, but the work will be done together. Now, fair warning, there are going to be skeptics and people who say that we cannot rise above the toxic partisanship that we see too often in today's politics, where people care more about where the idea came from than is it a good idea. Those are the same voices that told me at the beginning of this campaign, you don't understand how politics works. And to them, I said and I say, we must govern on big principles and not on petty differences. <laughs> that we must govern in a way that addresses the needs of all of our families and not worrying about what, the politi what a political ideology asks us to believe and asks us to do that we must govern in a way that we will never forget who it is that we're fighting for, 
and what it is that we're supposed to be fighting for. We know that in this moment we have a chance, we have an opportunity, and we have a unique place and space to do something special. And when people say, well, how do you know that you can do this or how do you know that you can execute upon this in this time of divisiveness, in this time of political vitriol, my answer is this, it's the only way that I've ever led. You know a question I never once asked my soldiers when I was leading soldiers in Afghanistan? What's your political party? It didn't matter. We had one job, one goal, and, my, and one mission. My job was to unify our unit and go out and accomplish that mission, and it's the same job and responsibility that we have right now. If we are divided, we can't win. But if we are united, we can't lose. Now we know that we stand here on the cusp and in a time of, of a measure of, of a historic measure. And we're very humbled by that. We know that in this time, that while for both Aruna and myself, that we're walking in a space that and we're able to see higher because of the shoulders that we're standing on. We also know that is not the assignment. That in this time and in this moment, we have a unique opportunity to lead and to love. We have a unique opportunity to build and to grow. But that opportunity can only happen if we're doing it together. Now is the opportunity that we have to march forward and to march together. And let us march on till victory is won. Today is not the victory. Today is the opportunity. It is our opportunity to lead with love. It is our opportunity to create with compassion. It's our opportunity to fight fearlessly for our future. Maryland, our time is right now. Our time is now to build a state that for those who came before us that they fought for, and it's a state that leaves no one behind. This is not a slogan, it is the fulfillment of a hope. Maryland, it's time, let's lead, and let's do it together. God bless you all, and thank you so much. It sure does feel good to be a Marylander today. Yes, it 